Welcome. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us this evening in conversation with Viet Thanh Nguyen in partnership with PBS SoCal and KCTS in Seattle. PBS Books is a proud partner with the Library of Congress in sharing its content for its national book festival with audiences across the country, both about the festival and the collaborative PBS broadcast. This evening is an important part of that partnership. So welcome. And to do a formal welcome from Seattle, I'm thrilled to welcome in Catherine Burby. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Heather. I'm proud to represent Cascade Public Media here in Washington State, home of KCTS9 and Crosscut. Our mission is to inspire a smarter world through our public television programming and local public interest journalism. And so we're happy to partner with PBS Books and PBS SoCal for tonight's event. I would like to acknowledge that our office is located on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, who are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. The Pacific Northwest is also home to many immigrants and refugees from around the globe. As we read and watch the news about Afghanistan with flashbacks to 1975, it highlights our constant struggle to understand the complexities of the intersection of politics, identity, pride, guilt, compassion, displacement, and belonging in the hopes of finding one shared humanity. Viet's work addresses all of these complexities, including his fiction novels like The Committed. In his own words, literature does not change the world until people get out of their chairs, go out into the world, and do something to transform the conditions of which the literature speaks. I hope we are all inspired by Viet's writing to get up out of our chairs after this event ends, of course. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, Catherine. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our library partners, 1800 Strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations, who share this important content with their communities. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Today's conversation celebrates trailblazing author Viet Thanh Nguyen, exploring his writing and his recently released book, The Committed. Viet will be featured in the Library of Congress's National Book Festival themed Open a Book open the world and the one hour PBS documentary special. Let's take a moment and watch the trailer. Hi everybody, I'm LeVar Burton and this is Open a Book, Open the World, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. When I try and create a work, work of fiction, one of my big aims is to create an entire world. And I think that kind of fictional world and how see, we, we see characters express their thoughts and feelings, that for me is opening up the world. I believe that narrative nonfiction is the closest that many of us will ever get to being another person. And that sense of empathy is good for anybody, but it's also particularly important, I think, for writers, because that's one of our most important tools is the capacity for empathy. I think uh, there's many places that I met for the very first time through a book. For me, books were a way of learning about the world and experiencing things I had never experienced before. Books have always just shown me just how big and how small the world is. A good book can take you on a journey. And after the last year, we are all ready to plot a new course and books can be an amazing compass. An addiction to reading has been a key secret of my success. It was literature that opened up so many pathways, so many possibilities for me. I read books so I could discover new worlds in those books. I, I had books that are in it. I don't even think of like, like this room, I don't think of having books in, but I have like 50, 60 books in this room. It's enlarging your horizon. It's your books are everything. It gives me more of a complex understanding of humanity, which I think is the power of stories, that we are able to see ourselves in all manner of different character. And that, I think, is what I enjoy from a great book. Join me as some of our nation's leading literary voices bring us a sense of renewal, discuss their newest work, and open up a whole new world of possibilities. The PBS 
Library of Congress, Open a Book, Open the World special premieres at 6 p.m. on Sunday, September 12th on many PBS stations across the country. Please check your local listing. The Library of Congress National Book Festival launches on September 17th and runs through September 26th. For more information, please go to loc.gov slash bookfest. So now, the moment you've been waiting for. It's my pleasure to introduce trailblazing author Viet Thanh Nguyen. Viet was born in Vietnam, raised in America. He is the author of The Sympathizer, which was awarded the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction alongside six other prizes. He is also the author of short story collection, The Refugees. The nonfiction book, Nothing Ever Dies, a finalist for the National Book Award, and is the editor of an anthology of refugee writing, The Displaced. He is the Errol Arnold Professor of English and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California, and a recipient of the fellowships from the Guggenheim and MacArthur Foundations. This year, he became the first Asian American member of the Pulitzer Board. He lives in Los Angeles. Welcome, Viet. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Hi there. It's a delight to be here. Thank you, Viet. We are so thrilled to have you this evening to guide today's conversation. I am thrilled to have Maria Hall Brown from PBS SoCal. Before I introduce Maria and hand over the conversation, I just wanna remind all of you out there, if you have a question for Viet, please put it in the chat because you will have an opportunity for those to be answered at the end of the conversation. Maria Hall Brown joined PBS SoCal in 1997. She is a senior producer and the producer slash host of the weekly program LA Art. Maria won a Telly Award and was nominated for an LA Area Emmy for the documentary film American Voices. In addition to creating numerous documentaries, Maria worked as a producer reporter for the Nightly News and the producer slash reporter of um, and host of an author interview series for more than 15 years. We are thrilled to have Maria here. She's a huge supporter of the arts and avid reader, and it is just my honor to have you. Thank you, Maria, for being here and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Heather. Um, I am beyond thrilled to have this opportunity to speak to this leading literary voice, this Pulitzer Prize winner, and I think this incredibly passionate, interesting, empathetic man. So yet I am beyond thrilled to be able to see you. And you're sitting at your writing desk. Hi, Maria. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I wish we could do it in person since we're in the same area. But well, yes, we're only 40 miles away. Yeah. We should have figured this out. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, I'm at my writing desk in my writing office. Um, I, I, I moved in here a couple of years ago, so most of my books have not been written here. Ah, well, it's a perfect spot for you to do this interview. And I want to thank you for your time because I don't think that you sleep. Um, not only are you a writer and a professor and an incredibly insightful speaker when it comes to a lot of uh, issues that are happening and a guest on many, many, many programs, you're a father of two. So you don't sleep, do you? I, I, I actually do manage to sleep, but, uh, you know, having kids really helps me to get disciplined in a way that I never thought I would be before. So I just got to make use of every minute that I can uh, when I'm free to write. All right. Well, speaking of writing, um, I know that you worked for, what was it, something like 17 years uh, working on the refugees. And then when you got your literary agent, he said, you're obviously incredibly talented. This is great. But people like fiction better. So you just ran home and decided to write a book about a spy? Well, he said, short stories don't sell in New York City, which is the general wisdom. Go and write a novel. That's what sells. And I always wanted to write a novel. I've always wanted to do it since I was really young. And so I took that opportunity to go write The Sympathizer. And you're right, I spent 17 years writing short stories. It was a completely miserable experience, but it did teach me how to be a writer and probably the most important lesson of all, how to endure 
rejection and obscurity. <laughs> and that really you know, prepared me for this journey of writing a novel about a man who is constantly rejected and lives in obscurity. So the sympathizer, however, didn't get accepted right away. Uh, well, the sympathizer, you know, we put it out for sale in New York City to 14 different editors. 13 out of 14 rejected the book. That was the most depressing day of my life, I think. Uh, but at the very last minute, the 14th editor, Peter Black's book of Grove Atlantic, did swoop in to buy the book. And Peter is actually not an American. I, I think all the other 13 editors were Americans. And I think the sympathizer was perhaps a novel that was perplexing to a lot of Americans because it's about the Vietnam War and many Americans have a lot of hangups about that war from an American perspective. And maybe it took someone who was not American to see what the novel was doing. It's a profoundly powerful novel on so many levels. And I think that actually listening to you talk about it and even reading the accolades about it could in fact be a literary work in itself because of the nature of how everybody responded to it and to you. Um, when you actually received the Pulitzer, you have said that you did not tell your parents right away. You know, my parents sacrificed enormously to raise my brother and, and myself. And, you know, they were, I knew they were proud of my accomplishments, but I didn't really feel like I should brag to them about what I've done. Um, they never bragged to me about what they've done. So in, I literally, when I received the Pulitzer, the news of the Pulitzer announcement, it did not cross my mind to call my dad. And what happened was the next day I was on the road and he called me and he said, hey, the people in Vietnam, the relatives in Vietnam called, you won the Pulitzer Prize. So that was sort of the circuitous way by which my parents found out. And it's testimony to, I guess, the symbolic value of the Pulitzer globally. Uh, and after that, my parents were a lot happier about me choosing the path that I did. Did they read The Sympathizer, by the way? I don't know if I've ever heard you say whether they did or not. I, I, I don't think so. My, my dad has my books above his, uh, his, his bed, you know, and, and has, me, has me take pictures with him when the new books come out. But, I, I, you know, again, they sacrificed so much for me. I don't feel like I should inflict more pain on them by asking them to read my books. Well, I, and, and I wouldn't say that you're, I mean, your books are beautifully written, as you well know, and as you've heard from many, many, many literary sources, as well as, you know, all of the people who have enjoyed your work for so long. But there is a brutality to what happens in them. So how do you feel if one day dad pulls it down and starts to read either it or The Committed? You know, what happened was uh, many years ago, after I published one of my short stories, it was translated into Vietnamese. This was the first time that the piece of my fiction had been translated. So I went home and I brought my dad a copy of that story. It's called The Other Man. It's found in The Refugees. And you have to understand, my dad is, uh, my parents are devout, very strict Catholics. The Other Man is about a Vietnamese refugee who comes to the United States in 1975, goes to San Francisco, and wrestles with the fact that he is gay and there is homosexual sex in that story. So my dad took the story and never said another word to me about it again. So he may have read it, he may not have read it, I have no idea, uh, but I think my family works on the principle that we shall not talk about anything that makes anybody uncomfortable. We try to protect each other with our silences. Well then, which brings me to this question, because there is such duality in your character, you know, who's the, the captain and the sympathizer and then you know, he's been renamed, no name actually, in um, The Committed. So this duality, these questions, where did all of that, because you're a very thoughtful person, you obviously have considered an enormous amount of issues from um, people's men in humanity to man to the, to the issues of uh, immigrants and obviously colonization in a big, huge way, but where did all of that begin for you? And where did you understand the depth of your narrator slash the captain slash no name? Well, I think you're right that in much of my fiction and nonfiction, I point towards how duality is an outcome of things like colonization and racism and, and all these big forces. But of course, we who feel the duality feel it very intimately within ourselves in our everyday interactions. So I started feeling that duality uh, by the time I was eight, 
nine, 10 years old, growing up in San Jose, California as a refugee, as the son of refugee parents who were working constantly in their Vietnamese grocery store, and growing up in the 1970s and 1980s and in time in the United States when there were a lot of representations of the American war in Vietnam on Holly, in Hollywood, for example, and there were some representations of Asians in the, in the mainstream Hollywood film as well. And from my perspective, it was very confusing because I felt myself to be an American, but these images, told me that I was not, that Vietnamese and Asians were others in the American imagination. And so that sense of duality began early. I certainly felt it in my own home. I felt like I was an American in my parents' very Vietnamese household, spying on these strange Vietnamese customs. But when I stepped out of that household, I felt myself to be a Vietnamese spying on Americans. And so I took that sense of duality that I think is fairly common among a lot of immigrants and refugees in the United States, and because I didn't lead a very interesting life, I created a, an alter ego in The Sympathizer who is much more interesting and took that core of emotion and put it into him and then greatly amplified it through his experiences. And that person also experienced a lot of uh, terror, a lot of pain, a lot of situations, and you even enhanced that in The Committed. Um, I know that you, your family on Christmas Eve experienced a, a terrible incident at their store up in San Jose. And did that affect you, making you start to examine man's inhumanity to man from a small germ to a gigantic plot point? So what happened, what you're referring to is that when I was very young, probably seven years old, and my parents had opened this grocery store in San Jose, they were shot there one night in an armed robbery. And, you know, it was not, they were not badly hurt, or if they, they were, they literally went back to work the next day. And so that was just a part of what it meant to be a refugee. I mean, some 10 years later, we had someone break into our house and put a gun in all of our faces as a as this person tried to rob us. And so I, I think that I felt that violence was a part of our lives, both in this intimate everyday circumstance of just trying to survive and, and what that cost, but also the violence of the war that drove us to become refugees and come to the United States, something that I was constantly reminded of growing up in a Vietnamese refugee community uh, and watching these Hollywood movies as well. And so even though I'm not a spy or like my sympathizer, I'm also not a murderer or an alcoholic or a womanizer, nevertheless, I, as every novelist should do, every writer should do, I took these feelings and experiences that I've had, and I put them into that character, and I also tried to empathize and to imagine how he would react if he was put into even worse circumstances. So for me, empathy is absolutely necessary, combined with experience and research, to try to create these types of situations that many of us have, have never been through. But nevertheless, you know, we have these core, this core feelings within us that if we know how to, to, to amplify them, we can turn them into fiction. When you've also done somewhat of a miracle in that you've taken this protagonist antagonist and made him um, someone who you want to be with for a long time. I mean, I think I, one of the quotes in uh, The Committed, and I'm not gonna be able to quote as well as so many of your reviewers have, but I did, something did resonate, you know, the path to hell is not only, it is not paved with good intentions, it's actually paved with rationalizations. And you feel those reasons why you're, why the, why the narrator has done what he has done and made the choices he has made. At the same time, he's questioning himself. And there's something incredibly compelling about that. So did you realize that you were able to create a character that people wanted to spend time with to the point in which you wanted to too, you did the sequel? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, sometimes I like to read fiction about really wonderful people that you, know, you just love unconditionally, and that's awesome. But sometimes I like to read fiction about people who are deeply complicated and conflicted. Sometimes they're unlikable, but sometimes they're likable in very complex ways. And I think for me personally, the narrator of these novels, the sympathizer and the committed is a complicated person who does very clearly egregious things and witnesses even worse things, but at his core, he is someone that at least I can empathize with because he's struggling with the, the, the moral questions that I think are important to all of us as individuals and as citizens of countries that have enormous power. And these questions are revolve around what should we do? 
you know, we're faced with these challenges, either personally or collectively as a nation, where we feel we should be doing something to improve the situation of our, our loved ones or our country. And yet when we do these things, oftentimes they have terrible kinds of consequences. So that's what he that's where he finds himself. And I I've always wondered how I would react in those kinds of situations too. I was very lucky being born the, the year that I was because I was born during the Vietnam War, but I was not old enough to make these moral decisions that the people who were 10 or 15 years older than me had to do. So I could recreate that in fiction through him, through someone who was as tormented and as ambivalent as I myself often feel, and as I think many of us feel too. So, so uh, you weren't done with him. You weren't done with your audience and you weren't done with uh, what he had to experience. You wanted to cause more chaos and you joked that, because there's a lot of humor in both you and in what's happened in your book. So you were just gonna, now you were gonna take, you were gonna take him to Paris and put the French, <laughs> you know, under the spotlight. So now he is, he's left his uh, re-education camp. He's gone to Paris with Bont and he has to go through, he's no longer a spy, now he's a gangster. Now he's in the drug world. Yeah, yeah. You know, what happens is that both of these novels are at least partly about nationalisms, Vietnamese nationalism, American nationalism, French nationalism. When you challenge people's nationalism, they tend to get offended. So with The Sympathizer, I got a lot of hate mail from different kinds of people you know, who, who focused on how I chose to offend their particular national perspective without taking into consideration how I was offending everybody else's nationalist perspectives too. And you're right. I felt that the French got off too easy in the sympathizer. So therefore in the committed, it was time to offend the French. And our narrator is part French and part Vietnamese, which is why he goes to Paris. Now, the other reason for, for me setting this novel in Paris is that I, like many people, am completely colonized by the French mentally. I love Paris too. I love all the sentimental stuff about Paris. But this novel is about the non-sentimental Paris. It's about the immigrant and refugee Paris that I also like to hang out in when I go to Paris as well. And the French, like the Americans, are, are deeply interested in genre, like gangster and crime stories. And I am too. I really love these kinds of genres. Genres. So I thought, so I wanted to make it into a, a genre novel just as much as the sympathizer was a spy novel. And so our, our sympathizer has been deeply traumatized by the events of the of the first novel. And when he gets to Paris, he makes some really bad choices, including becoming a drug dealer, um, or as he calls it, a capitalist. And of course, even now, today, with the Sackler family, where we see part of what the novel satirizing, which is that when it comes to things like crime or drugs, it's not really the low level street corner criminal or, or gangster or drug dealer that's really dangerous. I mean, you might be worried about meeting that person on the street, but the people who are making billions of dollars are the high level criminals. And that's exactly what the committed takes on. And I want to talk about those drugs because that you don't call them, I mean, you call hashish hashish, but you call, you call the really big stuff, the remedy. Your choice of how you name things. Most of the men in your work have some characteristic name to them. It just seems that there are only very special people, in particular women, that actually get true names that would be more reflective of being a person versus a stereotype. What an incredibly ingenious idea. And how did you decide that that is how you were going to write both the sympathizer and the committed, that these are just going to be almost non-name names. I wanted the novels to have a mythic quality in some ways, um, because with The Sympathizer, for example, again, we're going into the Vietnam War and people around the world, especially Americans, think they know whatever the Vietnam War means because it's been it's become a part of American mythology. Right. And I needed to, uh, disrupt that. I needed to disrupt people's understandings of that, uh, especially when it comes to the Vietnamese. Again, we are so deeply stereotyped in the American imagination. And therefore, because the American imagination is so powerful, its stories get exported all over the world. Everybody's affected by these American representations. So I wanted to make these novels very mythic to make the experiences of the Vietnamese and others universal in them. And partly the way to do that is to create what you called stereotypes, but which, which we, we could also call like archetypes. Right. Uh, of like the Iliad, for example, where characters appear, they're, they're not very well-rounded characters. They have, all have traits that are associated with them. 
And so we remember each character for a singular trait. And that's what these names are supposed to evoke. And you're right, the, the names of a few individuals are real names because I do want them to become more human in our eyes. And then finally, with the remedy, it, it's not very specific what the remedy is. Is it cocaine? Is it heroin? Is it something else? Yeah, and I, and that, that's deliberate because I didn't want people to get hung up on this idea of a specific kind of drug, but instead to focus on what a drug really represents. Why do we take drugs? For some of us, we take drugs because these drugs are a remedy for whatever it is that ails us. So what makes you choose to actually name a character a name? What gives them that elevation in your mind? I think when they are extremely close to our narrator, the sympathizer, and like you said, the sympathizer himself has no name. In the uh, in the in the committed, he's, he kind of gives himself a name, but it's really it's a joke because his name is Bo Yang, which is a no name. name. Yeah, no name or anonymous. And when you go to Vietnam, there's all these military cemeteries out there, and hundreds of thousands of the people who are buried there, these northern soldiers, on their tombstone, literally have only Bo Yang nameless. They're the unknown soldiers. And so he's given himself this name that's a, really a, a, a joke that's as much on him as it is on the French bureaucracy. But he does name his closest friends and his and his lovers because they're the ones who matter to him. Now, then, of course, once I got into this name thing in my mind, you know, it was sort of a jigsaw puzzle and I wanted to figure out. So Bond means we. Is that is that who did is that legitimate on your part? I mean, or that a choice on your part, or was that just me reaching? Well, Baban is actually a real Vietnamese name. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, it's, it's a couple of different versions of the name, but Bon is also Bon or Four in Vietnamese because sometimes people in Vietnamese are only given numbers as names. And Bon is also Bon in French or Good. So I wanted his name to have multiple implications uh, in both French and Vietnamese, but also uh, in English. There's a famous character by the name of Bon, for example, in Absalom, Absalom by, uh, by William Faulkner. And, uh, you know, if you go back to that novel, that character of Bon is a very, very complicated and violent uh, person, just as our character of Bon is in the sympath in the, the sympathizer and the committed. Right. And the last thing I'm going to get onto the tech of what you do, because that was also incredible. You use the book. You don't quote sentences. I mean, and you're not the first person to do that. There, you know, Beckett didn't, and Dotro didn't, and James Joyce didn't. You know, where you actually put quotes around that decision, and then also just the bold letters at the end of something, or you even blacked out like it was, uh, you know, didacted from some things when one of your, when the narrator was hearing. Um, utilizing the book, the words, the actual text itself as a way to visualize what you were doing. Interesting choice. You know, I, I in order to become a fiction writer, I had to learn the rules, you know, the various kinds of rules that you have, you have that, that are the conventions of fiction writing, including things like quotation marks and all the font has to be the same size and the same type of font. And, you know, the text has to be justified. And increasingly, as I write, the more I feel like, why? Why do I have to follow these rules? Why do any of us have to follow these rules? When we're kids, we don't we don't follow these rules. I look at my son, and when he's creating stories, he just straws all over the page. And there's something joyful and joyous in that, that that becomes disciplined out of us as we get older. And so increasingly, when I write, my, my, my question to myself is, why not? Why can't I do this? Sure. And it's partly inspired also by reading a lot of poetry. Like in poetry, the poets do whatever they want with the text on the page. They play with the text, the arrangement of the text. And that I found to be, you know, it's very pertinent to what they're trying to do with their poems, but it's also very liberating from both the uh, the writing perspective and the formal perspective and, and the graphic perspective. So all that goes into uh, the committed. I'm just having fun following my, my, my inspiration and hopefully there, that is also something that uh, is compelling for readers as well. No, I just enjoyed every single second of it because it was a surprise as you came around the corner. You know, even there's not this, not that this is a spoiler, but there's even a photograph in there. One which photograph. One photograph, but it has great meaning to where they are, what they're doing. But you're not done with them yet. You have the you're bring, you have a trilogy on the way. Third novel, and uh, Maria, it's coming back to Southern California. So it's going to be Los Angeles in the 1980s. I don't know if you were around in uh, Los Angeles anyway in the 1980s. I, I'm, I'm sure you grew up in the 1980s like me. And there is just so much to write about 
in the 1980s. Like I'm a child of the 1980s, and I just want to, I just want to talk about everything. You know, from Ronald Reagan to Star Wars to crack to, uh, you know, Iran Contra, and all of that will be in this final novel, which will be, I hope, as bloody and violent and sexy as the first two. It's not often you hear an author you know, say those <laughs> those words, especially one whose child wrote a children's book. <laughs> But, you know, I think we encompass multitudes. So I, you know, I'm, I'm literally working on another children's book right now. Uh, but you know, these are different compartments. Did Ellison, of my write, it? Yeah. Did Ellison write it, or did you write it this time? No, some an, a, an artist approached me with this idea for a story that I thought was really wonderful, and I can't draw, and she can, and she had a story that was sort of half done, and I came in and I fleshed it out. So I'm really excited about that one. So what did you learn from being the father of a children's book? Uh, the author of a children's book to uh, now being an author of a children's book. What did you, what was the? Well, you know, I, 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 number one, I'll confess, I never wanted to be a, a father, you know, like it, it totally terrified me, this idea of, of being a father, but my wife wanted kids. And if I wanted to keep my wife, there you go. We, we, and, and luckily, I luckily, I not only do I love my, my two kids, but I actually, I like them. That's weird. It's like, I like these two little kids. Um, and I'm not a person who likes kids. So that was really transformative. But watching them grow up, especially my son, because he's eight years old now and my daughter's um, 20 months, you know, as he grew, he become he becomes ever more creative and imaginative. And he looking at him, I can see myself when I was, I assume, seeing myself when I was his age. And again, seeing the the, the, the world sort of a world without limits, without boundaries, mm -hmm. where the adults are just telling you to do stuff and you just want to do your own thing. And I'm just trying to follow that energy and that freedom that he has and uh, find inspiration in it. And I really do believe, of course, I can teach him things, but children can teach us things as well. Okay, so there are lots of things that I want to talk to you about, but I am going to ask you, you are now not only walking into the the children's book world, but you're now walking into uh, film. Robert Downey Jr. is uh, actually going to produce uh, an HBO version of The Sympathizer. Yeah, you know, and my son, who's eight years old, is excited because, hey, he, he, that's Tony Stark. Tony Stark is going to be a superhero. in a TV adaptation, exactly. And, uh, you know, so we, it is going to happen. I've been told by HBO, I was in there in this meeting with HBO. They said it's going to come out in the summer or fall of 2023. So we have a date. All we got to do now is write it and shoot it. That's, that's, so the writing part is what we're about to, to, to embark on. Robert Downey Jr., of course, is the big news for most people who, uh, who are tuning in on this. Um, he is going to play all the white male roles in The Sympathizer. So that that would be a challenge and a really interesting one. Uh, and it turns out that he's, he seems to be a pretty nice guy from all our interactions too. Well, that's pretty exciting. Okay, well, we have more to talk to uh, you about, but I, I do want to let everyone know that I'm Maria Hall Brown and I'm here with Yet Tan Nguyen, author of The Committed, and you're watching PBS Books celebrating the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which begins on September 17th and runs through September 26th. And just a reminder that I'm not the only one that's going to be asking questions. If you have a question for Viet, please place it in the chat. Now we'll go back to our conversation for just a second, and in a second I'll be able to introduce you to someone else too. So, Viet, what is it like to know that for the rest of your life you are going to walk into a room and never ever ever shake the title Pulitzer Prize winning. Uh, well, well, just have it put in there uh, in terms of. Uh, I, I just feel like my life is all downhill. I mean, literally, it's all downhill. I could probably die, and that would be the one thing people would say, and The Sympathizer would be the one book that people would know. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's, that's actually fairly incredible in a lot of ways. Um, it's very liberating for me personally, uh, because I feel like there's nothing else I need to do. Not that I won't do anything else, but there's nothing else I need to do. I have this one prize I can point to, and that means I am free to write whatever I want. Uh, and that's exactly what I intend to do.
Yeah, that's very, very true. And there's lots more that you're going to do. But I would like to introduce someone else right now. And I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Pate from the Washington Center for the Book. Now, the Washington Center for the Book is the state affiliate for the Center for the Book at the U.S. Library of Congress. The Center has a book in uh, the Center for the Book is in all 50 states. And through book discussions and other literary humanities program, the Center strives to broaden and deepen appreciation for literature that expands the world of the reader. So, Sarah. Thank you, Maria. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so the Washington Center for the Book is a partnership of both the Washington State Library and the Seattle Public Library. So it may not surprise you that I'm going to ask you a question about libraries. Um, I wonder if you could tell me about the role of libraries in your life, um, both personally and professionally. I mean, libraries have been so important. Um, my, some of my earliest memories are of the library in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where my family resettled as, as refugees in the, in the mid-1970s. And uh, I just sort of, my, I, seemed, I seemed to have just emerged fully into English and, you know, was already reading kids' books when I was like five or six. Uh, and the library, the public library in particular, was so crucial for me because my parents were always working and um, the library became my second home. We had no books at home, so I would always have to go to the library every week with a backpack and bring home a backpack full of books that would sustain me until the next uh, next weekend. And those books were my my tickets to another world outside of the confinement of what it was like to be a refugee child. And I read all you know the classics of children's literature, but because libraries have no borders, at a young age, I was wandering off into sections of the library I probably should not have been, you know, going into, um, and reading all kinds of books that were way, way too advanced uh, for me psychologically. I could read them, but I didn't understand them emotionally. They left such a big imprint on me and really shaped me as a writer, so that even decades later, I would write books that would refer to the things that I was reading when I was 10 or 11 years old or 12 that had really marked me or scarred me, like Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaint, which I read. But I was probably 12 and I, under, I, I understood nothing about that book, remember, remember nothing about that book except for the fact that Alex Portnoy masturbates with a slab of liver and then puts it into the family fridge for dinner later that night, which is really shocking because who eats liver? As it turns out, my family ate liver. So I really identified with this Jewish American experience in, in Portnoy's complaint. And if you read The Sympathizer, it appears alluded to in that book. Well, and I also believe that um, maybe one of your earliest literary awards came to you from a public library for a, a little known piece called Lester the Cat. Is that correct? Lester the Cat. Yeah. Well, you know what happened was my elementary school um, had all of us draw and write and bind our own books. So literally, that's I did the whole thing. And Lester the Cat is a story about Lester, who is an urban cat suffering from ennui. So even at in the third grade, I was I'm concerned with alienation. And Lester decides to run off to the countryside and marry, uh, there he falls in love with a, a country cat who is a female cat, or I forget her name, and they get married and live happily ever after in a barn. So a very heteronormative story, already percolating in my mind, that at the third grade, public the public library gave me an award, and that put me on the road to, you guessed it, 30 years of misery trying to become a writer. <laughs> And so, so earlier in the interview, you mentioned your love for deeply complicated and not always admirable fictional characters. I wonder if you could maybe share a few examples of, of some of your favorites, either recently or in the past. Oh, well, there's so many, like Alex Portnoy, for example, left a mark on me. Uh, Larry Heineman's novel, Close Quarters, about the Vietnam War, really, really scarred me. I think most Americans read Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, which is an excellent book. But... Uh, uh, Larry Heineman's Close Quarters is the book that would make you uncomfortable in a way that the things they carry do not, that did not. Um, of course, Ahab from, from Moby Dick. I actually have read Moby Dick, have you? I, I recommend it. Uh, I love that book. Um, and then pretty much anybody out of William Faulkner's works or Toni Morrison's works, like Beloved, for example, um, you know, Setha and Beloved, very complicated character that nevertheless we follow through all the way. Thank you. So, so we've talked about your books. We've talked about uh, the upcoming uh, film ventures. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the audiobooks that have been created from your works, whether you have anything to do with those. And <laughs> well, um, the Sympathizer and the Committed are both performed by Francois, Francois uh, Chow, 
Francois was is is was it's actually Vietnamese, you know. I mean, he was he was born in Vietnam, but then was his I think his family were his father was a diplomat, so they were in Cambodia. And then when the war ended, they fled to the United States as refugees. And Francois grew up as an Asian American and became an actor. And he speaks French, so it's great for those parts of the book that are in French. And he also has, unlike me, with my high-pitched voice, he is a deep, gravelly, masculine voice that I think is perfect for the sympathizer and the committed. And I did read the audio book for the refugees, which I think I did okay on, except you know, partway through the book I realized, oh my gosh, there are accents in here. Australian accents, English accents. I can't do these accents. So I called my editor, Peter Blackstock, who's British, and I said, Peter, call me back and record for me on my phone this part of the book that's in English with an English accent. And I'm gonna try to try to imitate his very sophisticated uh, English accent. I have no idea if I succeeded, probably not. So in other words, having a great a good actor for an audiobook is really, really important. Thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed this chance to get to speak with you. Um, I'm now going to hand the reins back over to Maria, who will um, take some questions from the live audience as well. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> that was amazing. Well, I think yet what you have proven to everybody is that you're multi-talented in so many different ways that I don't even think you probably realize. You are incredibly uh, prolific on social media, and now you are also on the Pulitzer board. Uh, so I want to get to the questions, but before I lose my last question, um, what do you look for now, and does it make you realize what a great writer you are that you got one? Uh, what do I look for? You know, my life is so busy that I the Pulitzer read that you're reading. The, oh, the, 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 the Pulitzer reading is yeah, the, on the being on the board for the Pulitzer. I see, I see. You know, it's been enormously educational. I've only been on there one year, so we went through a whole cycle and, and gave out awards. And I read all these categories that I'd never read before, like biography. Uh, this is not something I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, what are you doing? Get out of here. Can we eat dinner in front of mommy's computer? Yes, you can eat mommy's Yes, go. Thank you. Okay. Make mess. Yeah, so that was the eight-year-old um, asking a very important question. Um, I did cook dinner, and now he wants to go off and watch. Say watch. talent with talent. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, there is no Pulitzer for children's literature, which is kind of unfortunate. But what do I look for? I mean, we in each category of the Pulitzer, there's already a jury, and they give the board three finalists. And I think they are all so different. I mean, imagine a whole category like biography. There's so many out there. So I'm really, for me, what I'm looking for is something that compels me, something that moves me, something that is alive in terms of the language of the book, but also in terms of the story that the book or the, or the journalistic piece is telling. Okay. Well, here's some things people want to know from you. Um, what kind of research did you have to do in order to understand the criminal side of the story in The Committed? Uh, you know, I actually wrote an essay about that for The Committed, and then I thought it was a pretty good essay, and then my editors were like, maybe you don't want to publish that essay. <laughs> it's the autobiographical essay about how I did some research, and I'm like, maybe you shouldn't, you might, you might get into trouble, you know? <laughs> so there is some personal experience that I won't get into. But other than that, you know, the research is, uh, you know, you read. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of articles um, about the drug trade, for example. There's there's a lot of work on the global drug trade that informs the the committed. Um, and again, going back to the example of the Sacklers, the Sacklers are not new. You know, the idea of very nice white people who are very respectable profiting off of of drugs is an old one. I mean, the original drug runners were the French and the British with their colonial empires and the Sacklers are only continuing in that long tradition. And then uh, for the committed, actually visiting Paris. I'd been to Paris before several times, but I came back for a couple of summers with the explicit intention of revisiting all the old haunts and familiarizing myself again with the streets and, and also just talking to as many French people of Vietnamese descent as I could because I wanted to understand their experience and how it was different from my own growing up in the United States. And so for example, in the committed, there is a character who is Asian, who is the crime boss, and he, and he was Vietnamese. So I asked my French people, my friends of Vietnamese descent, "What do you think?" And they said, "We French of Vietnamese descent don't do that kind of thing, meaning drugs and crime," which was a real surprise to me because we Americans of Vietnamese descent do this kind of thing a lot. So I turned the crime boss into an ethnic Chinese crime boss, and the French of Vietnamese descent were like. Yeah, 
the Chinese, they would do that. You're going to get in trouble again. <laughs> okay, so here's another one, similar idea, but a little bit more, um, uh, well, I'll just say it. Do you feel that being in America and trying to achieve the American dream, some Vietnamese men do become gangsters in a way to overcome the demasculization of Asian men historically in America? That's a heavy question. Well, you know, again, growing up in a Vietnamese refugee community in the 70s and 80s, I was I was exposed to Vietnamese masculinity of all kinds from people my own age, uh, teenagers and so on, all the way to grown men who had been through the war. And of course, with the historical understanding, you could say that um, there was emasculation taking place. I mean, you had these, for example, you had generals and, and warriors who had been in the South Vietnamese army coming to the United States. And suddenly they were no longer the, the, the same kind of men they used to be. They were no longer in power and they were no longer in charge, either in society as a whole or even within their own families. And that in combination with just being traumatized from the war and all that meant that there was a lot of things like domestic violence and abuse taking place along with alcoholism. And for the people who were younger, guys my age, there was a lot of gangsterism taking place as we tried or as they tried to assert their place in American society, which included becoming violent. But we were not unique in that regard. Um, you know, the reason why I'm fascinated by gangsters, including Vietnamese and Chinese gangsters, is not because they were unique, but because they were fulfilling a deeply, you know, widely held belief in American society that, that violence and gangsterism is part of the American dream. I mean, look at Martin Scorsese and the story of Italian Americans and the mafia. That's, that's, a lot of Italian Americans don't like that representation of, of Italian gangsterism, but that is one way that Italian Americans have become a part of the American story. And so I think that the, and finally in response to that question, it is both something very specific to being Asian and Vietnamese and being racialized and emasculated when it comes to violence, but it's also simply also simply becoming a part of the United States as well to, to become violent in a way that other Americans unfortunately recognize. And on the flip side of that, um, you know, there's the whole issue of the model minority. And yeah. yeah. I, well, yes. I mean, and, you know, the model minority is a stereotype, like I'm sure we're all aware of. And every stereotype always functions as a binary. It's like a coin. It's, it's, it's flat and there's two sides. And there's no such thing as a good stereotype. It could be positive, it could be negative, but every stereotype always invokes the other one. So if you're a model minority, you feel yourself to be a model minority or you're characterized to be a model minority, the problem is that you might be treated well in that circumstance, but the coin can always be flipped against you. So for example, my parents did what they were supposed to do as a model minority, as refugees in the United States, they opened that grocery store. That's what you're supposed to do, pursue the American dream. And yet they, you know, when I was a kid walking down the street from that store, I saw a sign in another store window that said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. So they were the model minority and they were the yellow peril all at the same time. And that's a story that's been repeated throughout American history, still being repeated today. That's why during the pandemic, Asian Americans have been targeted by anti-Asian violence. We've been associated with COVID-19 called the China virus and the Kung flu. So the, the model minority and the yellow peril still stick to us today. We have to reject both. Another question, uh, it's kind of a non sequitur, but I'll jump to it anyway. Um, are you going to have much hands-on uh, input with Robert Downey Jr. and the sympathizer to make sure that your vision becomes your vision and not some Hollywood's vision? I will say that if the sympathizer is a success, I take all the credit. And if it's a failure, I take none of the credit. Okay. Because I'm a writer. We don't really count that much, but I am an executive producer on the HBO series. Um, and I'm involved. Uh, for example, I helped Don McKellar, the writer, shape the overall breakdown of the episodes. We've talked about how they should be written. I've given feedback on the pilot script. I'm going to be there uh, in the writer's room giving feedback to the writers who are writing the scripts. That being said, writers are very important to TV and film, and yet at the same time, we're also completely devalued. So, uh, you know, my feeling is that there are many more powerful people involved in this production. Their opinions are going to count for a lot more than mine, but I'm going to do my best to try to steer the, uh, the sympathizer in a way that will be as faithful as I hope we can achieve in the adaptation. 
And my last question, sadly, because I would like to keep you a lot longer, but I don't think that they're going to let me. Um, we're in. We're getting close to the 50-year mark of the fall of Saigon, and there now have been so many children of children of children that are living only in the U.S. Um, are you learning things from them? Are you looking to their stories? Are you wondering what their experience is? Because you can't necessarily miss something you never had. Yeah, you know, one of the things I really believe is that for people like me, old people, you know, who have some measure of success, our job, especially if we're people of color or other kinds of my marginalized populations, in, in a publishing industry that is so dominated by, by, by basically white people, our job is not to be the gatekeeper. You know, our job is not to tell a younger generation, this is the way you have to do it. These are the stories you have to tell because this is what I went through. Our job is to cultivate new opportunities. My job is to open that gate if I have access to it. And my job is to do things like create new opportunities. So my friends and I, we have an organization we created called the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network at dvan.org, whose entire ambition is to create conditions for new writers and artists to emerge. And when they do, because they were born after the war or they were born in the United States, they tell unexpected stories. You know, so I'll point to a few. Uh, Lee Tran's House of Sticks. She was born in Vietnam, but long after the war. House of Sticks is about a refugee experience in New York City where Lee Tran's family has to open a nail salon. Anybody who's ever been to a nail salon has to read her book to learn something. Or Violet, Violet Coopersmith's new novel, uh, Build Your House Around My Body. I'm, <laughs> it's, it's a horror story, ghost story, set in Vietnam as, a, as an Amerasian Vietnamese returns to Vietnam. And I'm, I'm frankly terrified because I don't like ghost stories. And this has nothing to do with the war. And so this, these are the kinds of stories that a newer generation is creating. And I think it's amazing. That's exactly what they should be doing. And I'm learning from, from reading their works. You don't like ghost stories, says the man that puts ghosts in every single one of his books. Yes. Well, it's different when I'm creating it. But, you know, my ghosts are not scary ghosts. You read Violet Cooper Smith's book. I had to stop last night because it's it like I'm, I'm, I'm at home alone in the dark. She's talking about a ghost who is like dripping something in the corner. And I'm like, oh, God, I got to stop because I'm <laughs> fearing myself at this point. Especially when you need to calm Ellison down. All right. So earlier, Catherine said that you have asked us all to get up out of our chair. Um, and if in fact we do get up out of our chair, I know my job is I need to go become more literary and read more because all the allusions in your book made me want to read more books. Um, brilliant, interesting, compelling, and just demonstrated that I don't know a thing. So what do you want others to do uh, when you say get up out of your chair? Well, you know, I think uh, so far as literature goes in the world of reading, we all owe it to ourselves and to others to read widely outside of our comfort zone and outside of our habits. So, you know, I, I mean, literally, I have an Excel sheet where I track what I read. And as I hear the category of American authors and international authors, I want to make sure I'm trying to read more international authors. I want to make sure I'm reading as many women as or as men. I'm happy about the fact that this year I'm reading more women than men, for example. So we have to use the power of literature, not just to entertain ourselves, which is very important, but also to educate ourselves and to expand our horizons. That's one way we can figuratively get out of the get out of the chair that we're we're so used to being in. The other thing is that if we're actually moved by the social and political and cultural situations that we encounter in our literature, we can do something. I mean, not all of us, all of us have time to be activists and to join organizations if you can, if you, if you wish, but donate money or amplify things on social media. There's so many things that demand our attention and our time right now, so many pressing social and cultural issues. Uh, that's why I do believe that literature has its own special function as art to awaken us, to entertain us, but it can also get us to do something in the world that's also really crucial too. Well, thank you for your voice. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your humor. And thank you for your inspiration. This has been a really amazing treat. I'm just really sorry I'm not in the same room with you, but maybe we can work that out on a future date. And I wish you a world of luck on everything that you do. Thank you so much, Maria. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's throw it back to Heather. Thank you. Thank you, Viet, for transporting us to new worlds and for sharing your incredible work with us. We are appreciative to M Maria Hall Brown for guiding this evening's conversation 
and for Sarah from the Washington Center for the Book. Thank you for coming as well. We need to close today's conversation, but I want to remind everyone that this conversation was part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival, which launches on September 17th. So we hope you will go. This evening was brought to you by PBS Books in collaboration with PBS SoCal and KCTS. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening. I look forward to seeing you soon. Next week, we'll be interviewing Christopher Paulini on Wednesday, September 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. Hope to see you then. Good night.